by request, a detailed look at the Piopoli Magneto X's linear motors. How do they work, how do they perform, and are they even needed in a 3D printer? This is the second video I'm making on Piopoli's first FDM 3D printer, the Magneto X. In the first, I gave insight into the field testing of the machine and some of the challenges that had been identified and overcome. And it was clear from the comments that many people wanted a deep dive on the linear motors. So I quizzed the Piopoli engineers with many questions and conducted some stress tests to bring you this video. Let's start with the most important question, what are linear motors? In the last video I asked the same question and compared them directly to the stepper motors commonly found in other 3D printers. But perhaps a better comparison comes from looking at a three-phase motor like this one from a quadcopter. Whereas a brushed DC motor has two wires and a typical stepper motor as found in our 3D printers has four, this brushless motor and the linear motors inside the Magneto X instead have three wires. If we open up our example, we can see that there are 12 coils. These coils will be energized and become electromagnets. Around the outside of the motor, we can see some permanent magnets. Energize the coils in the right sequence. Those permanent magnets will be attracted to the coils and the motor will rotate. Whereas here, these magnets are arranged cylindrically to facilitate rotation. On a linear motor, these magnets are arranged in a straight line to facilitate linear motion. The coils sit in the carriage above the magnets. So when they're energized in the correct sequence, we can have linear motion. If you want to learn more about the specifics of the coils energizing to create linear motion, I've linked this detailed video by Lessix in the video description. Despite having magnets the whole way across the rail, this is not like a maglev train, so linear rails are used to guide the motion and keep it smooth. The last key component built into the motors are encoders. This is something we rarely see in 3D printing, only found on closed loop stepper motors. Their job is the same as the encoder in these digital calipers. As one part moves over the rail, the encoder can measure and detect the position quite accurately. This creates closed loop control where inaccuracies are measured and automatically accounted for, which should mean improved, more reliable results. One last quick thing to note, the configuration for X and Y may not be what you would expect. Looking from the front with the screen in front of you, X actually runs from front to back and Y from left to right. So that's the hardware, but what's going on in the electronics and clipper firmware to make this possible? The first thing to understand is that Clipper has no idea that linear motors are attached. In fact, the configuration for X and Y is the same as a generic A4988 stepper motor driver. We simply have step, direction, enable, and the amount of microsteps. And probably the only unusual thing is the step pulse duration. Therefore, there's no section for TMC settings, like we get for each of the TMC2209 driven Z motors. Therefore, all of the magic happens with the dedicated linear motor electronics. So now let's answer, how do the electronics components work? Firstly, this 24 volt power supply serves the hot end, most of the fans, and all of the other stepper motors. The bed is mains powered, therefore, this 48 volt power supply is solely for the linear motors. If we look at the X and Y outputs on the Octopus Pro mainboard, we'll see instead of stepper motor drivers, we have adapters and a wiring loom heading elsewhere. That elsewhere being these linear motor driver boards, one for X and one for Y. Those wires from the main board enter these long ports down the side. So how about the other connections? Up the back, we have 48 volts and ground in from our dedicated power supply, and then our three wires out to drive each linear motor. Here's a better view of that, and we can see the three wires out is just like our brushless motor example from earlier. And coming back from the linear motors is the encoder data. So summing up the drivers, they receive step and direction commands from the main board, process this to energize the linear motors, that creates movement, and they'll automatically adjust this movement for accuracy based on the encoder feedback. But there's one more set of cables to account for, and that's the connection to the linear motor controller board. This is a two-way communication, accepting commands and parameters from the linear motor controller, as well as sending back errors. And here is that linear motor controller board on the left. At the back, we have our wires going to the driver boards as we just saw. And then at the front, we have some status LEDs and some buttons to enable, disable, or reset the linear motors. Each of these pokes through the top of the electronics case for visual inspection and access while everything's together. There's a USB-C connection between the orange Pi and this controller board. 
and at the moment we can wirelessly emulate those physical buttons, enabling and disabling the linear motors. Finally, there's a single wire from the controller back to the Octopus Pro mainboard. We have a G-code button set up in the firmware that will pause the printer and report the error on the display. To summarize, this controller acts as a bridge between Clipper and the drivers. It sends initialization parameters to the drivers when the motors are powered up. It can accept commands from the Pi and report back errors to Clipper. And in future, the communication between the two will be increased. There's a bit going on here, but as far as Clip is concerned, the printer is just running regular stepper motors. So how does that affect things like input shaping? Are these linear motors compatible with Clipper's input shaping? If you don't know what input shaping is, I've linked my Clipper guide to this in the description. In the Magneto Axis tool head is an ADXL accelerometer. So tuning it is just as simple as running the inbuilt macro. For X and then Y, the tool head will be shook back and forth at varying frequencies. This is difficult to see, but you can definitely hear it. As Clipper does with this auto tuning, we have a bunch of parameters spat out at the end, some graphs saved on the Pi, and we can store the recommended values by entering save underscore config. So the short answer to our question is yes, but it's not that simple. And that's because linear motors aren't automatically compatible with Clipper. The motor drivers have algorithms for smoothing and filtering, and these particular drivers have been engineered with special attention to this, so Clipper can send the modified signal without doing anything different. Given everything is separate from Clipper, how do we handle things like calibration, updates, and adjusting settings? For the Z-axis stepper motors, we can change a range of parameters directly in the Clipper configuration file. But as we saw earlier, this section is quite sparse for the X and Y linear motors. Therefore, settings changes and updates are both conducted by programming the controller board. We connect a laptop to the controller board with a USB-C cable. Firmware updates can then be flashed to the motor controller. Piopoli then have a separate piece of software that you can use to set aspects like maximum current. To calibrate the encoders, we have a straightforward process, but this is a little bit cumbersome on my pre-production model. And that's because I have to unwrap and then twist together these two wires. The production versions of the printer will instead have a much nicer switch to toggle. Once you're in this mode, it's just a matter of moving that axis back and forth at various speeds by hand. Once we've done this roughly 20 times, we simply disconnect the red wires in my case, or flip the switch back in the production version, restart the printer, and we're done. So now we know how everything works, but perhaps the real question is, are linear motors actually better? Let's address the elephant in the room. Are linear motors worthwhile or just a gimmick? The first thing to note is that linear motors are typically used in high-end CNC machines. Their speed, power, and precision makes them ideal, and these machines are so expensive they don't put the price on the website. There's no doubt that Piopoli has done an impressive job in designing their own custom hardware, electronics, and software to bring linear motors to 3D printing. But even though their implementation is cheaper than other machines, it still makes for a printer that's not exactly cheap. So what we need to do is to test this printer against the claimed benefits. For instance, high repeatability, fewer print artifacts, and a more reliable experience. We can also test the max quoted speed and acceleration and see how well the closed loop correction works. We can also test aspects not listed like volume. These linear motors will hiss at idle until they're disabled. Besides the button, we can do this from a macro and in our NTT code. During normal printing, the volume of the linear motors is quite low and you can barely hear it over the heatsink fan. And once the part cooling fans are at 100%, that's the only thing you're going to hear. Next up, repeatability. Whether the machine can move somewhere and then move back to the exact location. With Piopoli claiming 0.003 millimeters. My dial gauge only has two decimal places of precision and I did struggle to get it square. So the measured movement can probably be ignored as any slight misalignment with the angle will shorten the measurements. But what is clear is that when I return to the original position, the dial gauge goes back to exactly 000. So it's more repeatable than I have the ability to measure. So what about reliability and reduced visual artifacts? Orca Slicer actually has a built-in test for VFAs, which stands for Vertical Fine Artifacts. And I set mine to run from 50 to 250 millimeters per second. This imports an SDL and varies the speed over the height of the tower as per your specified range. Here's the result of the same test on my Bamboo Lab P1P 
and as you can see, there are vertical lines going down all of the walls regardless of speed. These artifacts for me have increased over time, and I believe that's because over time, the belts can lose their alignment on the pulley, rubbing on the top, and also because the belt tension can change, both independently and relative to each other. My patron Patrick developed a method for centering the belts on the pulleys and getting their tension equal with fantastic results for VFAs. So that's something to consider in terms of reliability for belted machines. It's not like they're going to snap, but they will need periodic maintenance to get the best print results. The Magneto X has no belts because of the linear motors, so maintenance should be improved, but what does this mean for the VFAs? Here's my test print, and as we can see, at lower speeds on the bottom of the tower, we have the vertical stripes. But as the speed increases, we seem to hit a sweet spot where there's zero VFAs. This is evident from just under 200 millimeters per second feed rate. This type of test is hard to get perfect because it's also influenced by the extruder, but compared to other machines, this is still quite good. On a Core XY motion system, the squareness of the X and Y gantry is largely affected by belt tension, but the Magneto X is not Core XY, it's probably closer to something like an Ender 5, a Cartesian with independent X and Y motion, and that means the squareness of X and Y will be set during the factory assembly of the machine. So to test accuracy and X and Y skew, I purchased and printed the Vector 3D Cali Flower. This test is easy to print and easy to use, and the only other tool you'll need are good calipers. You then put all of your measurements into a table and the results will be automatically calculated. As we can see here, the skew is 0.04 of a degree, and the dimensions of my X axis are slightly too long and my Y slightly too little, so I might need to run the calibration again. My inner versus outer are both very slightly undersized, so I might need to up my flow rate just a tad. Something really nice about this spreadsheet is it gives instructions for how to apply skew correction in various firmwares, and of course it does that for size compensation as well. For only $11 it's a bargain, so please head down to the link in the description and support Adam by purchasing it. So what about max speed and acceleration, as well as closed loop control? Remember that closed loop control is permanently in effect and will automatically correct deviation up to an error of 2mm, in which case the error pin is triggered. We can easily test this when the printer is idle by forcing it to move position, and it does require a fair amount of force. This will set the status LED for that linear motor red, and I find it's best to restart the printer to fix this. I also tested the Y axis, and the current must be set a lot higher because it needed quite a lot of force to trigger the error but clearly the real test is the printer moving by itself. And I thought about running Orca Slice's max flow test for this, but to get the speeds up near the quoted maximum, unless I tweak the settings quite a lot, I would run out of flow near the start of the test. And I could change to one of the longer melt zone hot ends that came with the printer, but at this stage that's too much mucking around. Remember, we're trying to test the motion system, not the extrusion. So instead, I'm going to use this Clipper Maximum Speed and Acceleration Macro from Ellis's print tuning guide linked in the description. When you run this macro, the printer will home, complete quad gantry leveling if it's in your configuration, and then slowly move to the bounds of the print area. Part of the reason it's doing this is to accurately measure the position from home. It will then go into the testing phase, moving through a set pattern using the speed and acceleration values that you input, and it'll repeat this as many times as you specify, with the default being 5. And then at the end, it will remeasure its position from home. The before and after values will appear in the console, and you can compare them to see if there was any skip steps beyond those that might have been visually obvious. And on the Magneto X, we can also check the status lights for the linear motor controller. Assuming the test is passed, we can then repeat it by upping speed or acceleration values. I worked up to the maximum quoted printing or extruding values of 800 mm per second with an acceleration of 22,000 mm per second per second. With this test getting a perfect result, I continued running the tests, this time maintaining the 22k acceleration, but gradually upping the feed rate towards the 1500 quoted for maximum speed travel moves. This was quite a violent process, and the linear motors sound quite different to a stepper motor at this pace. The maximum I could achieve was a speed of 1400mm per second with that same 22k acceleration. The output was still perfect at this stage, but when I upped the feed rate to the full 1500 millimeters per second, on the very first diagonal move, the machine stopped with the status LEDs both turning red. Piopoli told me that the firmware was limited to 1500, so I dropped it down to 1490, but I had exactly the same result. So I couldn't quite hit the travel speed, but the acceleration was no problem. 
just for fun, I dropped the feed rate to 1000 millimeters per second and upped the acceleration to 30K and that one passed with flying colors. And for double fun, I then upped the acceleration to 50K and this proved to be just a little bit too much. The error state kicked in and this is probably a good safety feature. Most people utilize Core XY kinematics for really fast 3D printing. But here we have a Cartesian system with quite heavy components compared to a speedboat race modified printer. But I guess the combination of brute force and the closed loop control helps the factory spec Magneto X move very quickly and maintain perfect positional accuracy. Hopefully that's enough information to let you decide if linear motors and 3D printing should go together. Let's finish up with a few more points that were brought up in the comments of the first video. There were quite a few comments wanting to know if the linear motor magnets would be affected by heat. And this is particularly important considering it's an optional acrylic enclosure that will raise the temperatures around the motors. Piopoli previously sent me the enclosure, so let's fit it and see how it goes. This took somewhere between 90 minutes and two hours to assemble and fit. There was nothing too complicated. I would instead describe it as a series of simple steps. The enclosure looks pretty slick and from the front we have access from both the top and the main body. We also have additional access from the side of the body. There's two options for the display. The default door has cutouts to clear it, but alternatively, you can mount it up high on the top of the enclosure and then fit this alternate panel, which should do a better job of sealing. So with the thermistor from a multimeter hovering inside above the bed, an ambient room temperature of 23 and a half and the heated bed set to 100 degrees, I left the printer for around half an hour to heat up and found that the temperature climbed inside to just under 50 degrees Celsius. I then heated up the nozzle to 250 and ran a cycle of 50 speed tests and that pushed my chamber temperature to just over 50 degrees. I reckon I could get that higher by filling in some gaps, for instance changing to the alternate display mounting and door and using some of the tape that came with the enclosure on the inside to seal up some small gaps. Now that we've tested, here's what Piopoli had to say. The linear drive magnets are rated officially to 80 degrees Celsius. The other electronics have been tested to 60, so it's recommended to keep the chamber below this. And that should be easy because without any active heating, Piopoli have not seen the internal temperature rise above this. One last question I saw was were the linear motors going to be available to purchase separately for other printers or other projects? I put this to Mark and here's what he had to say. To paraphrase, as implemented in the Magneto X, the current package isn't quite refined enough to sell as is. However, they are committed to creating a more adaptable and user-friendly version in various lengths and specs to suit various projects. So nothing guaranteed, but it is on the cards. Hopefully I've now covered most of the frequent questions from last time. And if you want the latest on this printer, follow the link in the description to the Piopoli blog. The situation with this printer is still fluid with regular updates coming along to improve small aspects. So at this stage, I wouldn't describe it as just works, but most of the people that have their hands on it seem to be pretty happy. Thank you so much to the Piopoli engineers for answering all of my questions. Thank you to you for watching and until next time, happy 3D printing. G'day, it's Michael again. If you liked the video, then please click like. If you want to see more content like this in future, click subscribe and make sure you click on the bell to receive every notification. If you really want to support the channel and see exclusive content, become a patron. Visit my Patreon page. See you next time.